Dear Julia, Your lovely sunny epistle comes close to the theory of life. Splendid. Clearing things up is out of the question, you say. Nevertheless, on those states you describe as id, you express yourself with the only means possible. Poetry. Geranium, seagull, oyster. And, already in reducing your words to flower, bird, and mollusk, I elaborate, I distort. I obliterate the transitory quality. In the meantime, I have moved from Dakar to Loire, the regressive site of my childhood, as well stocked with seagulls as your island by the sea. In addition, there's the passing moment of unsettled strangeness that accompanies the return to the capital of one's own country. To see Paris once more at dawn, the plane landed around five o'clock in the morning is to discover its facades restored by virtue of absence. A window with medieval panes one has never seen before. A caryatid, a curious-looking roof. Le Place de la Concorde, entirely empty, recaptures a revolutionary look, in spite of the fountains. It doesn't last, but an empty city is nice. What relation does it have to the sacred? For me, the return... Strangeness, the void, and early morning. We agree on the most feminine of the fundamentals of the sacred, the atheism of the labor of meaning. But let me give it a somewhat different name, the atheistic mysticism of meaning. Let's not leave the word mysticism to the fringe elements of religions, and let's use the connotations that word has in its very etymology, mystery and initiation. In the beginning, the Greek miste simply meant initiate. As Georges Bataille has demonstrated, there is nothing incompatible between that atheistic mysticism and the exercise of reason. Provided, however, that one takes a proper survey of it, does the owner's tour with posts and measuring tape. I will not try to clear things up, since you don't want to, but I would like to draw my bow and clear a few shots, as a way of not losing the space between atheism and mysticism. Each in her own way, you and I have both explored the apparent returns to in the forms the sacred takes. Return to childhood, to dirt, to the anal stage in initiation rituals. The return to the body, both pure and impure, internal and external, in the precise lyricism of the mystics. The return to motherhood, which you are right to say is the source of the sacred. But it's a long way from the about turn you express so well to the dangerous illusions of return denounced by Lacan, which I mentioned previously. So then, what is that danger? The very term regression implies a return to a bygone past, real or imaginary. That is one of the pivotal points of Freudian thought. During a discovery phase, Freud groped around before settling the matter. No, there is no original primal scene, duly established by the facts. There is no real return to the past in the psychoanalytic cure. The traumatizing origin is only a reconstruction, a fantasy made of bits and pieces arranged by the unconscious, in the way a saxophonist arranges a musical theme. In the place of a primal fallacious truth from which all the repetitions of an individual's life would originate, Freud posits the screen memory. This much is clear. There is a screen, which it is pointless to knock against. That is why regression is not a return to the past, but a return of the past in adult life, in forms contrary to the codes of behaviour. You know it better than I. The unconscious is not polite at all. It is barbaric, poorly behaved, foul like Puinia. The poor hungry girl Aristophanes dreamed up as the mother of love in Plato's Symposium. But just because a human being bleats for love doesn't mean he becomes a real sheep. Freud's lesson is also that the past remains in disguise. For example, under the fallacious appearance of a geranium sky and an oyster-coloured gull in flight. Now, the mythology of origins uses and abuses the sacred, making it the foundation of countless, not to say all, religions. The repeated celebration of a sacred event 
necessarily borrows the notion of mystery from the idea of origin, indefinitely repeated in the rite. The Christian Mass repeats the Last Supper of Christ, the rigorous pilgrimage to Mecca, that of the Last Pilgrimage of Muhammad, and the dual African burial repeats the journey of the familial ancestor from life to death, and then from death to life. The establishment of the rules of repetition becomes a code, which Freud would call obsessional, and the sacred is framed by the schedule of the rite, which begins, unfolds, and ends according to an immutable rule. Introibo ad altare dei. I shall rise to the altar of God, and the rest follows. But the starting point of the sacred is as buried as the elements of the screen memory. Hence, there is not a great deal known about the exact process of revelation. We do know, more or less, what landscapes predispose one to revelation. High mountains, steep cliffs, vast snowy expanses, deserts, dark caves. That does not tell us anything about the state of revelation. The philosophers have trouble with these boundaries. Apart from Kant's reflections on the sublime, I am thinking of a few emotional outbursts of Nietzsche in Ciel Maria. I remember Pascal's words when he was in a state of rapture. Joy, tears of joy. And certain passages by Kierkegaard on the internal leap into the state of anxiety. But I do not know much more about it. During his period of revelations, Muhammad suffered violent headaches. What state was he in exactly? What about Jesus in the desert? The question does not arise. Then every religion plasters imagery onto the strange psychic transformations of those who experience the state of revelation. The prophet received the inspiration of the angel Gabriel. Jesus in the desert was tempted by Satan. As for the content of the process, it has disappeared from the scene. The Romans, without knowing as much as we do on the neurological plane, were intuitive enough to attribute sacred power to their epileptics. At least epilepsy's short circuit of consciousness has the merit of being complete. Inspiration is found in the set of phenomena known as the aura, before the seizure. Blue lights, shaking, hallucinations, bizarre odours. With the convulsions, everything disappears into darkness. Don't put words into my mouth. Epilepsy is a special case that does not explain everything about the content proper of the sacred. Of course, we have learned more about it since the mystics, women and men, took up their pens to describe their journeys. But if you and I are consistent in our logic, we ought to conclude that the sacred, a journey outside time, is deprived of beginning and end. When does the sacred moment begin? No one really knows. One feels it coming on. And when does it end? With exhaustion, which is not an end. It is not original in nature, and it is up to the myth to articulate the two or three universal formulas repeated in all cultures. At the beginning of time, at the beginning of the world, in the beginning was. Now, myth is a linguistic object structured by a complex logic. It does not speak the truth about the origin, it simply speaks. My dear Levi Strauss, yes, him again demonstrates throughout Mythologique that myth has no other reality than the logics of thought concealed behind the narrative. For example, analysing the myth he chose for his starting point, he breaks down the role of the macaw feather in Bororo society. The blue feather belongs exclusively to the ornamentation of men's belts, and if someone finds it attached to a woman's belt, it can be deduced with the naked eye that somebody's been screwing around in secret. Granted. Then, the subsequent myths set in motion a logic as secret as the furtive prohibited coitus in the forest, and the process is never-ending. Beyond it, religious extrapolation. And sometimes danger. Until proof to the contrary, in fact, the search for the origin at the collective level has always produced the same effects. Radicalism, racism, rejection of the cross-pollination of populations, and the migratory flows that constitute the history of peoples. The examples are so numerous that one has to be selective. The myth of the original Aryan in Nazism found a following, alas. It proliferated in all forms of fundamentalism, whether Muslim, Jewish, or Hindu, in an immutable form. We claim the origin of origins, the first territory, the lost race, the pure religion distorted by time. So Muslim slums are burned down in Bombay in the name of purity the originality of Hinduism, 
and a country, Palestine, claimed in the name of priority, is torn apart. In the valley of Band-e-Amir, the Talibans of Afghanistan want to blow up the giant statues of the Alexandrian Buddhas, older than the revelation of the Prophet, on the grounds that they represent divine images contrary to Quranic instructions. The destructive effects of that tension between the purity of origin and the impurity of history are far from over. Let me take an example I see close at hand. Many Africans won't rest until they have demonstrated that humanity originated in Africa. And one of the most illustrious intellectuals of Senegal, Sheikh Anta Diop, wants to prove that all Africans were descended from the Egyptians who were black. Why Egypt? Because the mother of civilizations. Granted, but then what? What does that prove? That the Egyptologists were Western whites who, for white men's reasons, dissimulated the Africanness of the Egyptians. Good, but so what? Oh, but all white man's thinking is anti-black, don't you see? No argument is made, because there was colonization by whites. The Africans are ancient Egyptians, so there. And now racism has resumed in reverse, on a question of origin. The quest for origins. What rubbish. Look at the legal battle between the holders of blood rights and the holders of land rights. The former are on the side of the origin and become racist without even realizing it. The latter cling to the only sacred element in the idea of the Republic, the one that stirs in both of us at the sound of La Marseillaise. Let's talk about that feminine image, Marianne, the strange idea of erecting into an icon a woman who is doing battle while holding a bloody flag. You'll tell me that since the revolution and the empire, Marianne has been bardotized, denervized, marceauized, Grave error. Marianne is a notion of the mother available to all her children, and a soldier for their freedom. Marianne must not be embodied in the features of a real woman, however representative her beauty may be at a given time. Marianne is not destined to be embodied, since she is the abstract concept of a mother protecting countless children. There is no origin in that. Marianne has no birthplace, age, face, or skin colour. I am the godmother of a little girl baptised in accordance with the Republican right. That is, I signed in writing a commitment to take care of her if need be. The Republican sacred is registered on a paper that endures and is inscribed in law, which applies to everyone without discrimination on the basis of origin. Granted, the Republican sacred has seen some deviations. It produced the reign of terror. But precisely... It became murderous only after it was transformed into a religion of the supreme being. Ritual, ceremony, and persecutions. A new origin is defined, and the past is wiped clean. Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao, Hitler, Kim Il-sung, your choice. They wipe clean or return, impose a clean and proper origin. Clean and proper, the opposite of dirty. And, you admit, the sacred requires disorder, even a kind of dirtiness. Few ideas are as productive as the need for disorder, an old, very old idea that never wears out, and that demonstrates its political viability from time to time. I'm thinking of an excellent book by Jean-Luc Mélenchon on the mastery of chaos. Disorder, the moment of revelation that makes your head ache or makes you sweat blood. Disorder, the unexpected perception of the vacuity of the desert, of the immensity of the mountains, of the scope of the storm. Disorder, the process of artistic creation described by Anton Ehrenschweig in The Hidden Order of Art. As for myself, I do not see any disadvantage to folding a part of the process of art back onto that of the sacred. Ehrenschweig describes the stages a bit laboriously, as a psychoanalytical drudge. First, he points to a brutal disruption of the elements, a disturbance in the order of life. Then, in a second moment, a scanning, that is, a rapid sweeping away, a recomposition of the elements into an order about to give birth, a yet unknown lying in. The third moment is a collapse into depression, followed by profound disgust. Finally, the work, that is, the acknowledged advent of a different order, springs forth. Let's leave the work of art to the artist. What interests me in all this is the first moments, Agitation, scanning, depression. 
The totality of the process described by Anton Ehrenschweig makes me think of the baby blues experienced by new mothers in the hours following childbirth. The enormous agitation of the body is followed by the birth of the new, a moment of depression for the woman and of joy. Baby blues would be a fairly good characterization of the sacred, applicable to any act of creation, whether it is truly maternal or metaphorically so. That's enough to irritate Soler. Hasn't he sufficiently denounced the baby as currency in contemporary sexual commerce? Nonetheless, Soler, come on, the baby of baby blues is not emotional blackmail, since he is already born. He has already fallen from the body accompanied by his placenta wrapping, which in so many regions is buried under a tree or the house, out of fear that the double of the soul that has just been incarnated will be lost. That baby already has its own life, whereas the mother's baby blues designates the effect of vacuity. The belly is devoid of its burden, like the mind in Buddhism. Baby blues expresses the mother's psychological state in the aftermath, the pure feeling of having been the sight of a passing, and the feeling that now it's over. Strangely, the image of a ferret comes to mind, that little furtive rodent Lacan uses to represent the signifier. It has come this way, it will return that way. One generation follows another. I understand the baby. The blues remain. Why, after the birth, is a musical term bestowed on the baby. The blues, the music of deported slaves, originated in songs about the land cultivated for the masters, a land that will never again be that of Mother Africa. I put the term in quotation marks to invoke the last two words in Senegal's national anthem, lyrics by Leopold Sedar Senghor, Hail Mother Africa. Well, did you know that deported African slaves in Brazil committed suicide by eating dirt? I never understood the true meaning of that strange death until I was in Dakar, working with my students from Sheikh Antadio University. Oh yes, on the transitional object according to Winnicott. In Western Africa, the transitional object does not take the form of a diaper or a stuffed bear, but might very well be made of dirt, which the child joyfully swallows under the compassionate eye of the married women in the family. The custom is not only accepted, it is prescribed. To grow up, you have to eat dirt. In exile, die from dirt that is not your own. Eat your dasein, said Lacan, quoting Heidegger. It must be understood that in Africa, the dasein is of the earth. The blues came from it, just as the breath of song comes from the muscles of the belly. I'm trying to connect disorder with your plum line, and I think of the singers in India. Whatever their sex, their style, and the instruments accompanying them, they all have the same body posture, the same hand gestures. The body is seated, legs crossed, perfectly balanced. As for the hands, one is on the ear to ensure the proper resonance of the chord, and the other flutters about, up and down or side to side. The head of the singer, whether male or female, cuts through space, horizontally when a note is held, vertically for an ascending scale. The voice never rises or falls without an accompanying gesture that traces the motif. The musical equilibrium is clearly traced in space, especially given the fact that the notes of Indian music are marked in half and quarter tones. Watching it all, the listener rises and descends the sound scale. Among the Molawiya, the whirling dervishes in Turkey, the equilibrium of the spinning body is also ensured by the arms, one up, the other down but one hand is turned palm up toward the sky and the other down toward the earth, so that the whole body is a vertical vector between the two, a plumb line. Choreographers will tell you dancing relies on a relation between the earth and verticality. I remember hearing Karine Saporta mention rural dances, dances of the land, the foundation of which remains invariable, flamenco, shamanistic dances, the very slow dances of the shite in Japanese no drama. And it is from that vertical docking that the feeling of weightlessness arises, in music as in dance. Lightness. Lightness, that's a word that Kierkegaard and Nietzsche resort to when they move beyond gravity. 
both outline three dance steps, inviting women to their metaphysics. For Kierkegaard, they are, in Mozart's operas, the fleeting partners of Cherubino, Papageno, and Don Giovanni, in whom the philosopher perceives the three ages of manhood. No so piu cosa son, cosa facio, a Cherubino aria, adolescent love. Pa pa pa, a Papageno aria, procreative love. The champagne aria for Don Giovanni, dispersed love. For Nietzsche, it is unnatural powers. Carmen in Bizet's opera, the small-eared Ariane. It is thus, in becoming girls, that the philosophers accede to the metaphysical lightness of music. What nonsense. As if music were not a heavy weight to bear. Have you ever seen a singer or a conductor as they come off stage? They are gasping for breath. After the famous aria at the end of Act One of Mozart's Don Giovanni, the singer is prostrate, choking for several long minutes, struggling to catch his breath. At the end of the concert, the conductor has lost a few ounces of weight, and his uniform, black tie and tails, is soaked with sweat. Yet his baton is light. But, he says, the effort of carrying the orchestra on the end of his arm is terribly tiring. That's a different matter from Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. The price of lightness is always a huge physical weight. The result has to do with the sacredness of the stage. When the performance is over, the artist falls into a fatigue-induced blues. Hence the necessity for him, after the end of the show, to prolong the night, obliterate his effort and bring the body back to society's norm, which was left behind for the duration of the exercise. The cost of weightlessness is paid in sweat. But if you yourself have ever danced, I'm talking about so-called recreational dances, you must be familiar with these sensations. After a long waltz, an interminable tango, any mbalax at all, you're emptied out. Recent studies on fatigue have demonstrated what we already knew intuitively. During exercise, you don't feel fatigue to the point that it drives you to rapture. And dance, when it is recreation, even has the purpose of tiring the body to achieve a lightness of consciousness. It ends, you breathe, you are empty, you are fine. Ready for anything, for oneself, for the other, for nothing. That happy fatigue seems to me to verge on the sacred, which means in all cases that it is necessary to leave the body. Nothing says you can't do it in the right mood. Music the supreme mystery of the human sciences that drives Levi Strauss to despair at the end of the introduction of Mythologique sets to the task. What Levi Strauss says about it, however, is not negligible. Music takes hold of its listener via the slow movements of the internal organs. It draws its effects from visceral time. A simple example, the binary rhythm of techno music in sync with the rhythm of the heartbeat. More complex is the broken 3-2 tempo and the syncopes, which play on the stumbling, the swaying of time. Something like the heart stopping, then starting right up again. Let's call it a heart palpitation. But as for accounting for the exact nature of the music. For example, the musicologists have been at one another's throats on the subjects of the effects of percussion on the trance. Is it the percussive hammering on the drum that unleashes the trance, or is the percussion only the coded signal of the trance? You cannot imagine what pitched battles this little problem of drums was able to elicit. In the first case, the trance is of physical origin. In the second, it starts in the symbolic. And there is nothing that makes it possible to decide. Levi Strauss is right. Music, material and ideal, physical and spiritual, remains an unassailable roadblock for the sciences. So much the worse for an understanding of the sacred, or so much the better. Music, unanalyzable, unthinkable, is the medium of the sacred. What I like about the myths on the origin of music is their cruelty. The invention of the lyre by Apollo was the result of the sacrilegious massacre of divine herds. His flute is inseparable from the flaying of his rival, Marcias. Then there's the story of Orpheus, who, in return for pacifying wild animals with music, had his head cut off by the Bacchants. There is the imagery of Shiva, god of life, death, music, and dance, 
marking out the expiration of the soul with his minuscule tambourine and dancing on the exquisite corpses. We can make out the origin of the taut skin of drums, the dried guts of strings. We can discern the horror of the man chopped to bits. In fact, although the sound box may be a gourd, for sound proper there is nothing like the texture of a living being. At the time of the Hussite Wars in the 15th century, the large rallying drum of Jan Ziska, the Calixtine, was, it is said, covered with human skin. And in Japanese myths, only the body of a consenting virgin who throws herself into the molten metal makes it possible for the founder to obtain the purity desired. These legendary acts of barbarism anchor music in an imaginary sacred, a bit like in the Rite of Spring, in fact, when the virgin is sacrificed. Chaprier, from whom Levi Strauss borrows the epigraph from Mythologique, addressed this beautiful invocation to music. Mother of memory and nurse of dreams. Maternal and soothing music. It is conceivable that something human was sacrificed to it. It is possible that music was then consoled by singing. Despite the excesses that it might elicit, it remains the best, the most sublime, cradle for journeying through the salubrious nostalgia for the sacred. It is dark. My own gulls have gone to sleep. The river is emptied of their wings. A vague, sleepy squawking signals that, on the opposite bank, the herons are dreaming in their nests. The starry sky, dear to Immanuel Kant, is above my head, and I hope that moral law is within me, as simple reason requires. I imagine it is not by chance that, after beginning in Africa and America, we are ending our correspondence in France, near the water. You on your island of Ré, and I in my Loire, so close to each other, and yet so far away. At a good distance for thought and epistles, about a hundred kilometres as the gull flies. A constant interval between worlds, which has allowed us to digress comfortably. Have we digressed? Certainly. I claim the indefeasible right to digression, and in the case of the sacred, the right to sacrilege. It does not seem to me that we have abused it, since we have sought the proper use of a minimal, indefeasible, and demanding sacred, like any true atheism. A digression draws to an end in the wait for dawn. It is three o'clock. It will not be long now. As a good philosopher owl, I'm going to take off my glasses and close my owl eyes. Catherine.